This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? Well, with Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states and situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can automatically grow over time when you open a savings account. A high-yield, low-effort way to grow your money with no fees. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone to start earning daily cash and growing it with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Speaking of saving, travel is one of the things definitely worth saving for. But that's kind of a hard question, right? How do I save money for something that's so far off in the future? Well, one of the things that we know is that if you build saving into your normal daily habits, then suddenly you end up having this pot of money that can get pretty big. For instance, one thing that I do is I always try and each week automatically deduct from one of my bank accounts a certain amount of money that goes into a travel account, something I hardly ever pay attention to or hardly ever notice until it's time to take a trip. And then when I look at it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can afford that upgrade. Here's all the money that I need in order to make it happen. It doesn't feel like an expense because that money has been sitting there waiting for me to use it. And I didn't really miss it when I was saving it because it happened automatically. One of the things that we know is really powerful is setting up automatic deductions so that before we have to choose whether to save money, it just happens automatically. And it ends up an account that we can use to travel around the world. Hi, how to team. My name is Rebecca. I have had this question for a long time. I am, like probably many people, overweight. And I've always been that way. And I'm now 39. I still find I'm influenced by you know different diet cultures that come around or looking in the mirror and being like, oh, well, this isn't the ideal body type. How do we change that, you know? So if you guys have any advice or answers, I would love to hear them. I I really enjoy the show and hope to hear from you soon. Bye. Welcome to How To. I'm Carvel Wallace. And if you haven't already guessed, today we're going to be talking about bodies, specifically how we value or don't value them based on how they look, on their size or shape or ability, and how deeply all of that rather arbitrary ranking can really mess with your head and screw up your sense of self-worth. We know this topic can be triggering for some people, so if this episode is not for you, then take care of yourself, and we'll see you next week. But for those of you sticking around, I think it's safe to assume that you too are being inundated with messages about your body. It's too big, it's too small, it's not muscular enough, it's not curvy enough, etc., etc. And even though it's always bad, it's particularly bad at the beginning of the year when advertisers jump on the resolution trend to sell you quick fixes and everyone seems to be talking about how they're going to improve their bodies starting today. It's messaging that is everywhere. And our listener, Rebecca, would like a break. I want to get to a point where I can just meet the new year and just be happy to be me and find acceptance, I guess, really with, you know, my body and who I am. And Mm -hmm. if I feel like I need a smaller body at some point for any reason, you know, okay, fine. But I just want to find peace in the body I have. Mm. What is it? feel like inside of you when you are farthest away from that peace that you seek? Um, I feel like it's the first thing on my mind when I wake up and the last thing on my mind when I go to sleep. And Mm -hmm. it's a lot of guilt and shame and it's just kind of not a happy, just kind of dark place. It's ironic if you really think about it. Like all of us, Rebecca just wants to feel at peace in her body. And that's the one thing 
promised by all of the movements, whether it's body positivity or body neutrality or the six week shred your gut program or whatever. They all promise to help you get to a place where you feel good about who you are and what body you are in. So why doesn't it just work? I follow as many people of different body sizes as I can on social media. I've talked to my therapist and we've discussed, you know, like just observing people in in the wild as I go about my day. And, you know, I find myself judging everybody, every body type, even, you know, besides myself. It's like, oh, well, why can't I look like that? But, you know, then my brain goes into, well, you do look like that, you know, and so there's so much comparison that just happens. Mm. And I don't even realize it until I consciously go, whoa, those thoughts are happening. Like, I need to roll that back and stop. Do you think it's possible that there is like a bot, like an ideal body that you could have where you wouldn't be troubled by these thoughts? That's the magic question, I guess, is like, yeah. I assume that there's, you know, a place where I could just be comfortable in my body. My body definitely mm-hmm. has ideas about where it likes to be. <laughs> you know, I've, mm-hmm. I've tried mm-hmm. losing weight and it brings it back to kind of this like certain zone. And mm. um, even if I've gained weight, I come back down to a certain zone. So like, you know, if you're at 190 or 199, you know, my body's happy mm-hmm. in that zone. But everybody, you know, from doctors to my parents when I was younger and everything else, it's like, oh, well, you really should fit into this mold here because you're like you're 5'7", and you should weigh 150 pounds or something. So Mm, there's definitely mm -hmm. a disconnect with my brain and what the messages around me are saying. And, of course, it's like I've been programmed (laughs) to want the same things, (laughs) I guess, at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Imagine that this problem is solved. Imagine what we do here in this conversation magically fixes everything permanently, which I don't think it's going to happen because core beliefs are very difficult to shake up. And as good as our podcast is, I don't think we're that good. Um, But imagine somehow that magically happened. What would your daily life look like? How would it be different from what it is now? Um, I'd love to wake up and pick something out of my closet and not think about how I'm going to feel in it all day. (laughs) Like Mm. just put it on, not care and go about the day, be able to pick whatever food I feel like eating and not think about a thousand things connected to that food, not look at my kids and worry about them getting like, you know, well, maybe they're on the same path that I'm on and, you know, do I need to do more for them? And there's a lot of thoughts that have just come back to the the weight and the size and things. So I feel like my perfect solution would be to not have that constant background noise, I guess. So here's the thing. We can't completely solve this, but we can talk about it, human to human, to hear how others navigate this same issue, which is why I'm bringing in Ronald Young Jr. Ronald is a talented producer and storyteller, and he spent a lot of time exploring his own relationship to weight in his award-winning podcast, Wait For It. A lot of my adult life has been spent waiting. Waiting for everyone not to be paying attention before I take my shirt off and get into the pool. Waiting for the flight attendant to surreptitiously hand me a seatbelt extender. Waiting until I lose a few pounds before I buy new clothes. Just a lot of waiting. It's felt like waiting to be perfect before I truly start to live. So on today's show, Ronald is going to help us wade through Rebecca's questions. How do you learn to love your body? And is love even the thing we should be aiming for? Stay with us. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting and all the while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. 
Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you may just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare. So it's simple. Choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states and situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can automatically grow over time when you open a savings account. A high-yield, low-effort way to grow your money with no fees. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone to start earning daily cash and growing it with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Growing up, Ronald Young Jr. wasn't fat, but body image still, if you'll excuse the pun, weighed on his mind. You know, you feel like most of your life, when you think about weight generally, it's mostly a cautionary tale about telling people to stay away. You don't want to get fat. Mm. And you spend a lot of time, if you're straight-sized, avoiding getting fat or not doing things that would make you appear that you're going to get fat later because Mm -hmm. it's frowned upon. But when you get to a place where you can no longer have that argument in your mind, it's just like you are a fat person. Uh, The kind of calculus of how you approach life and all that begins to change a bit. And that's kind of where I am now, where it got to a place where I'm not I'm no longer avoiding getting fat. I just I'm fat now. And so it's like, how do I how do I then accept all of the things that are around me or like how do I exist in this world that kind of is not really set up for fat folks at all. Like, do is this chair going to hold me up? Do y'all have clothes that mm-hmm. fit? Am I going to have to buy everything online? Uh, mm-hmm. How is dating going to go for me now? All of that stuff uh, is kind of what I'm, I'm grappling with now. I'm going to ask you, Ronald, about this term straight size. This is the first time I've heard that. I mean, I've heard so many other euphemisms for it. But where does straight size come from and why that terminology? Yeah, all it means is not fat, not plus size. <laughs> uh, and so I, I believe there's like an actual technical definition for it, like a, in terms of like the sizing, um, which you would have to look up. But I think like casually, it's just used to determine like you are not a fat person, you are a straight size person. You know, the working title of this episode is is how to love your body. And I was thinking about that a lot as I was coming here to record this. And it's not should you love your body. It's not what to change about your body so that you can love it. It's like how to love your body as it is. And I guess I wanna ask you, Ronald, why is it so important to love your body as it is? I mean, I don't know that it is important to love your body, uh, and I hate to blow up <laughs> the conversation. Uh, okay, but thanks, thanks for coming. Good yeah. night, everyone. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think we're taught that you're supposed to love your body, and I think that mm. that is kind of encapsulated in the idea that you are going to be in a state of mind in which you are happy with your existence and your being in any <laughs> given moment. So let's just think about all the ways in which we are not happy with our existence and our state of being at any given moment. Like just, I'm wildly gesturing to everything around me in the world uh, right now that has <laughs> nothing to do with our weight. So like the idea of like uh-huh. loving your body in the middle of that feels almost like pie in the sky type of thinking. I almost think like the way in which that we moralize it saying like, you gotta love yourself, you gotta love your body. Uh-huh. I mean, when the truth is, you know, we're, we're fed so many messages that tell us to do the opposite or they just tell us to change our body so that we can, you know, then love it or then put ourselves in uh-huh. a position to get this thin person out and actually live the life that we're supposed to live. When actually, I think probably the, the best thing you could do is accept your body in its present state. Like you can accept mm. it. Like you can accept it. You don't you don't have to reject it. And I think the rejection is really what gets us in a place where we're in a constant state of dissatisfaction. Satisfaction. Now, the other thing that I can tell you is that I haven't necessarily accepted my body. It took me a long time to even accept that I am fat. You know what I mean? And I still struggle with the mm. idea of anybody else calling me that. Like, even in this conversation, I don't want y'all calling me fat. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm like, it's still something that I accept uh, in my mind. I mean, even if anyone who says that they love their body or says that I should love my body, I would say, well, why? Like, 
why? Why do I need to? Why do you need to do that? So I would almost question that. But uh, if we if we want to instruct people to a place, we can instruct them to a place of accepting their body. Because mm-hmm. if you accept your body, then there's things that you can understand when you like shop for clothes, mm. when you get on a plane, when you start dating, like all of these things. When you start accepting those things that are in front of you, uh, then you mm. can really start to kind of live the life that's presently in front of you. Because I think being present is the most we can do. I mean, what we're talking about, like when we think about what Rebecca's saying, and I, and I think this is something all of us can relate to, I certainly can, is the unhappiness, the obsession, the constant feeling of I'm not right. And everyone knows it and I'm embarrassed to be seen in this way. And so it follows that people are like, well, the solution to that is to feel like you are right. Like that would be the solution. But what you're saying is something slightly different than that. There's a kind of acceptance of all things, even the parts that are difficult, that actually leads to the to the the serenity. Is that kind of am I getting you right there? I mean, I don't listen. I don't know if you're gonna I mean, for you, for you. I know you're not <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I can I, I don't want to this isn't advice show. I did bring you on to an advice show. So yeah, no, 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 you're you right. I, preach a little bit. Not, not me saying, listen, I don't want to get I don't want to tell you what to do, Rebecca. <laughs> no, right, right. it's I, I feel like when it comes down to it, you've kind of stated it because I want to wake up in the morning and I want to feel okay. That's the most that I want to ask for. And I think there's too many people that are telling me reasons why I should not be satisfied with the life that I have right now. And that constantly puts me in a state of anxiety, like all the time, just Mm. saying like, well, I don't have enough. And, And there's so many real reasons to not be satisfied with the life you have now. What I don't need is a lot of other messaging that's continuing to tell me that the body that I'm in is completely unacceptable while I'm also trying to worry about the cost of a gym membership, for instance, Mm -hmm. every month added on top of rent, every other bill, car note, whatever you have. If you have children, Rebecca, like like you have Mm -hmm. children, like kids are Mm -hmm. a million dollars a kid, apparently. That's a real number. Mm -hmm. So there's (laughs) just feels like if you want to get to a state of contentment with yourself, the first thing you do is just wake up in the morning and just like shake yourself and say, do I feel okay? And what would it take for me to feel okay right now? So I guess my question to you, Rebecca, is to say, like, are there things in your life that you could be doing that would make you feel okay in the present that you perhaps haven't been doing? I very much resonate with just that acceptance. And I know that I have been working on things like journaling in the morning when the house is quiet for as long as it'll be quiet (laughs) and I can enjoy my coffee, (laughs) get some thoughts out so that they're not just bouncing around in my head. And then at the end of the day, one of my favorite things is to do different kinds of yoga and stretching. And Mm. um, like that's, I find peace in moving my body, but also not being judged by people. So like, I I don't know. I like that whole accepting where I am is is much better than trying to be something that is just not attainable or go jumping to the love side is Mm -hmm. just hard. If you're working on that, if you're if you're if you're adding habits that make you feel good and you feel good in those habits and to be clear if you want to lose weight if you want to do that that is your choice you have bodily autonomy if that is a part of what is making you feel okay in the present then so be it but i think if you're aiming for that sense of contentment what you'll find is that your goals will change your goals and what you're actually mm. reaching for will completely change because i find that whenever i've been like really striving for weight loss specifically, I find myself in this constant state of waiting, W-A-I-T waiting, waiting for something that's going to come in the distant future. Everything else becomes on hold because I got to lose weight first and get to wherever I'm going, as opposed to saying like, what can I do to feel good right now? And how is that adjusting my vision for the future? It makes a lot of sense. And it's also a complicated thing for people to do because it involves holding contradictions, which people have a hard time doing, right? So on the one hand, you're like, well, if you want to lose weight, which is a goal-oriented process, I would like to change the number that appears when I step on the scale, then you can do that. But you have to be able to do that without waiting for that to happen. until. So it's about accepting now while you change, and these are contradictions. Tell us a little bit about how you learned to do that, because that's not what we're taught. You mean how I'm learning so to do that? Bit, how you're learning <laughs> to do that. I, I think personally, like for me, it became about push-ups. 
I started doing five push-ups twice, so it was 10 push-ups a day. So now I have gotten up to 35 push-ups a day twice. So I'm like, for me, I don't care what the number mm-hmm. on the scale says. Can anybody else in here do 70 push-ups? And I'm like, and that's the thing. So if you if you change your goals and just say, instead of worrying about necessarily this number, I'm gonna worry about other numbers, then you'll find mm-hmm. that you'll be you'll be more motivated to do what it takes to accomplish those goals. And for me, I'm not saying this as a trick because I feel like there's a trainer or somebody out there that was just like, yeah, and then you trick your body and the next thing you know, Mm -hmm. weight loss is a side effect. Mm -hmm, I think we just mm -hmm. have to kind of decenter weight loss in a lot of ways when it comes to living our life. Now, again, if weight loss is your goal, you really do have to hold that contradiction, (laughs) as Carvel was saying, which is like you really have to find a way to say, how do I make this about what I'm accomplishing today? And staying as present as possible without being so focused on what it's going to do in the future. And I think, to be honest, you have to interrogate why you want to lose weight. And I think most people that actually interrogate it, for them, it never really boils down to just wanting to lose weight. It boils down to wanting to be accepted in your body, which is different from accepting (laughs) your own body. And that's like a whole nother kettle of fish. Well, that's what I was going to get at. Our our ability to be happy is very much impacted by the way other people treat us. Right. So like if we if everything from the people that know us and the comments that people make to us to the way the world in general treats us or we watch people with our body types be treated certain ways in television shows and movie and popular culture, everything makes you feel like there's something wrong with you. You can do all of the trying to feel good you can, but every time you receive one of those insults, it attacks you. And I'm wondering if that has been your experience and how you have worked to navigate through that. Rebecca. When I've lost weight in the past, one of the things that was most frustrating, I guess, was when it was noticeable, you know, and I'm feeling, hey, look, you know, I, I'm doing this thing and I'm feeling good about it. Then someone would be like, oh, wow, you look great. And I was, my brain, instead of just being like, oh, well, they think I look great, my brain's like, well, what did they think about me before? <laughs> like, why is this a thing now? And why do they feel like they need to comment on it at all? And I've even noticed mm-hmm. like people around me, if they are, their bodies are changing, I will think like, oh, I want to compliment them. And I stop myself and I'm like, no, this is their journey. Like that's their thing. I have no right to comment on their body. <laughs> so it's really hard when the people around are commenting or thinking out loud or whatever it is, however we want to look at it. Um, And I am still grappling with it myself. Mm -hmm. You nailed it, though. Like, nobody should be talking about anybody's weight loss or weight gain. Weight loss and weight gain should be neutral. All the reasons why we gain and lose weight are all for like a variety of different reasons. Everyone assumes it's either you're eating too much or eating too little, but there's a variety of reasons and factors that are coming into it. I remember I had a friend of mine who was going through a divorce. She lost a ton of weight. And I was like, yo, what's going on with you? You you like, I remember we were working at a gym. This is back before I was enlightened. And I asked her like, hey, what's going on with you? She was like, I haven't been eating. I'm going through a divorce. And so it's just been hard for me to eat recently. And I was like, all right, you we, we got to work on this. We got to talk therapy, all of that. So there's so many reasons why we could be gaining and losing. The hardest part about this, though, Rebecca, is like you have to kind of put a shield in your mind to say, like, no matter what people are seeing or thinking about you, what matters most is what you think about yourself, honestly. And then you have to start a practice of and I have to I do this in my head when I look at people around me. I try to do a practice of like not thinking through their body types. You know what I mean? Not thinking about them being bigger or smaller or any of that. Just thinking about like if it's someone that a friend or a family, how much I love them, how much I miss them. You know what I mean? And not really thinking about, oh, because I mean, like if you're at church and I'm sorry, Carvel, I don't know if you're a, a black church attender <laughs> making, making some assumptions here. If you ever <laughs> happen, yes. Like you just walk into a room full <laughs> yeah. of black folks and if you have gained or lost weight, they are going to tell you. Yes. Gonna say it's, yes, it's not. Absolutely. It's you have to set your mind yeah. before you walk in there. Like, what am I going to wear? All of that. That's right. And then, and and I find the only other solution I have is to not put myself in those rooms in those situations, which may be a harder ask, Rebecca, especially if it's around loved ones or or colleagues or coworkers, whatever. But if if you can't do that, the first thing is to kind of just set in your mind that this is neutral, and what matters the most is what I'm thinking rather than what they're saying to me. Yeah, that's brilliant. 
that commentary in my head when I see other people mm-hmm. and focusing on, a, you know, so the first thing that comes to my mind isn't, you know, what their body looks like, changing it to like, oh, you know, I'm so glad to see you that, you know, or wow, it's been, you know, years. How are you doing? What's new? And instead. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it also strikes me, too, that there's this question about how do we change society so that it's, you know, so that this isn't happening and how do we change ourselves? And we know that, I mean, this is a common problem that comes up a lot on this show when we talk about systemic issues. We know that we can't change society uh, necessarily, although we do have a listenership here and we do get to proselytize a little bit on the show. And it feels to me, Ronald, that what you're suggesting is like, there is a tie-in between how we view the world and how we think the world is viewing us. In other words, it seems to me like we always believe that everyone is giving us the judgments that we're giving other people. And so it's possible that if we start to relieve, find ways to relieve ourselves from, from giving those judgments out, we might feel less judged as we move yes, through the world. Yes, I, I love the way you put that. I think that's true. I I think it, it starts with us, but I also think we should be proselytizing. <laughs> I think we definitely have uh-huh. to be telling yeah. everyone, hey, like, I, I just want to say this unambiguously. Do not compliment people on weight loss or weight gain, period. I think we should treat it the way when we uh, assume that someone is pregnant. Don't ask. Let them tell you. If they tell you, then that's where the conversation begins. But otherwise, some people are just moving through the world and they don't necessarily want to be noticed in that way. It starts with us on the inside saying, a thought pops in your head about someone else's body. Just question the thought. It takes two seconds for you to question yourself. Now, why did I think that? And then just sit in that introspection for a minute and say, why did I think that? And and you'll find it like the more you sit in that introspective and in that discomfort, you'll like start to learn things about yourself. And I think not enough of us are doing that self-work in order to actually change the so- mm. society around us. Uh, it starts with you and it starts with conversations like this and then... You got to hope for the best after that, man. (laughs) Okay, so what we're talking about here is a form of liberation, which is both an inside job and an outside job. And it's really, really frustrating when external factors make life more difficult. After the break, We're going to talk about dealing with weight-focused doctors and what to do when just being present isn't working. Stay with us. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. We're back with our listener, Rebecca and Ronald Young Jr., host of Wait For It. Before the break, we were talking about changing society's focus on weight. And one of the most important places where change is needed is the doctor's office. One of my earliest memories with weight being an issue was, you know, being three or four years old and going to the usual checkup and they're like, oh, you're you're off the scale. And then it Mm -hmm. just becoming a thing. So medically speaking, it was just like, I hated the first thing that they do is put you on the scale. And then the first thing they want to talk about was always like, oh, well, what are you doing to lose weight? And it's like, do we really? Like, I didn't even come in here for that. (laughs) So... That's the first thing I dread about going to the doctor. I'd rather go to the dentist. I'm, I'm honestly, I'd rather go to the dentist <laughs> and have my teeth cleaned. <laughs> that's, that's a damning indictment of the medical industry, right? Yeah, for sure. Doctors are tough because, like, it's, it's, it's. They don't get that much uh, training on nutrition in 
medical school, like contrary to popular belief. Um, and someone can fact check me on this, but it's 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 not that much time. I won't even say the specific time, but it's not that much. And when it comes to seeing a fat person in their office, it's almost like the only symptom they have for whatever ails you is their weight, no matter what you tell them. They could see evidence of mm. other things being a problem in there. They could see a hammer on the ground and they could see a knot in your head and they'd still be like, are you sure this didn't happen <laughs> because you're <laughs> fat? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, and I, I'm only saying that to say, like, I've been in doctor's office uh, just like Rebecca, where I went in there and I mean, I was in there and I was down 20 22 pounds and the doctor was still telling me how to lose weight. And I'm like, well, obviously I know how because I've already lost 22 pounds. Then the conversation began, well, you don't want to lose weight too fast. And I think it has a lot to do with the way that we stigmatize weight in society. And there's no real way to win mm. in a conversation with a doctor when you just need good care. And all they want to say to you is I they're kind of like holding your care hostage because they don't think you're doing enough mm -hmm. uh, to to lose weight or to deserve good care. But the truth is, everybody deserves good care. It doesn't matter how much you weigh or how little you weigh. Everyone deserves good care in a doctor's office. And they deserve to have proper investigation into the symptoms that I'm telling you about with my mouth. You know, like I, I think it, mm. it's just tough for doctors to see past wait and look at you as a person and say, how can I help this person uh, rather than just advise them to change their body? I mean, I don't have any issues with blood pressure. I don't have any issues with most of how my body functions. So when there is a problem, like I had a weird nerve pinched in my foot, but to get to the point where we figured that out, uh, we had to go around this whole thing of you know, well, maybe it's because you, you have too much weight on your body and your foot and blah, blah, blah. And I, I'd been running. I'd been doing all these other activities. It could have been any one of those. And <laughs> just because mm -hmm. of my weight, that was the first thing we went to. And I was like, no, I don't think so. I've never had this problem in my whole life. <laughs> I'm lighter than I usually am. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a constant redirecting with, with the physicians. These are huge problems socially, collectively, that we struggle with, and yet we're not going to change them all. So again, I want to return to this question of like, what do we do personally to better navigate this stuff? And Ronald, I heard you say that like, the idea that like, oh, just love your body and learn to love your body and be free is actually a little bit of a pipe dream. And so maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what your daily struggle is like if it's not, you wake up and you suddenly love your body. And how do you uh, emotionally deal with that struggle? We talked a little bit about what you do physically, but how do you deal with it emotionally? I mean, you know, waking up every day and feeling okay emotionally is is its own journey that, of course, is fed by how I feel about myself and my weight and my self-worth and a lot of negative self-talk that kind of creeps into my mind. Mm. You know, I, I went through a breakup recently and it was someone who I really loved and really felt connected to. And to have that vacuum in your life, it kind of like it, it gives an opportunity to kind of amplify all of the negative things that you think about yourself. And that's tough to deal with on a regular basis when you throw in the fact that you're saying before I even get to those things, will they, this person even be attracted to me because of my weight? Will they even look at me? Will they consider me a viable candidate despite what I look like in a lot of cases? I mean, it's just a tough pill to swallow all most days. So I find like, I mean, all I can really do is, you know, uh, you know, raised in the church. I pray a lot. Uh, I also journal Rebecca. And I mean, I just try to stay as present as possible and just think about what's happening right now in my life? What are the things that I can control? What are the things that I can be thinking about, you know, and working on and not just be so concerned about what may or may not happen in relationships, in love, in, phys in my body, in career, as much as I'm going to focus on what is happening in front of me right now. And if I can do a little bit of more of that every day, I find that I can bring my mood closer to neutral, not so anxious, not so depressed. And, and I'm just doing a little bit better. You know, I don't get it perfect every day. And of course I have days of immense joy, uh, days of immense sadness, but I think the more I can focus on what's happening right now, the better I can bring my emotions under control. I definitely relate to the little bit at a time. 
Mm. So with the mm. journaling, one of the, the questions that I, I have had to answer, you know, you go through and it's like, well, where do you see yourself in a year? And just pretend like you're already there and journaling that. And one of the beautiful things about that is weight never comes up. <laughs> like my perfect day never involves me thinking about what I ate or w what size my body is or, or any of that. It's just being in the moment and enjoying that. So I think that's a big part of it. I think Ronald really got that. It's interesting because it feels so much like um, that the questions of our body and all the external pressures on it really interfere with our ability to be present in the moment. And it's a little bit like the solution that Ronald is saying is that you have to just focus on being present and you'll find that you feel differently about your body. And I think a lot of what we're taught is that, well, if you change your body, then you'll be able to be present, which is kind of like that thing you were saying earlier, Ronald, that like this kind of fallacy that my life will begin once I lose the weight, once I get started losing the weight, once I get the ideal body type, then I'll start living a life in which I show up and love and dance and go on trips and you know what I mean? <laughs> but in reality, it's almost like you have to just start living your life now. Well, I, I was going to say was, you know, the Surgeon General has been talking a lot about this epidemic of loneliness. And one thing he said that like really struck me, and I know a lot of people can relate to this, is he's saying like, you know, a lot of times when you're feeling lonely, when you're feeling disconnected from people, your tendency is to stay away from people uh, until you feel better, mm -hmm. until you feel good enough to hang out with them. Mm -hmm. But he says, but like the truth is a lot of times those connections that you have are actually what make you feel better in the moment. So it's counterintuitive for you to think like, oh man, I can't hang out with these people. I don't feel good enough to hang out with them. I'm, I'm a little depressed. When it turns out the medicine is the thing that you're avoiding, actually. And so I think that this is the same thing. Like you have to actually strive for being present in what and where you are right now, which means that you really have to just take a hard mm. look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is who I am right now. Rebecca, what are the things, people, places, and or things that bring you joy, that bring you that feeling of presence. If I could drop everything, I'd be backpacking constantly. Like oh, I would be so outside good. hiking, mm -hmm. just being one with nature. And mm. if I could convince my children to go with me, then that would be fun. But <laughs> <laughs> I also enjoy it without them too. So uh, yeah, just, um, and moving my body. I love dancing, um, singing, you know, those things are just, the, they bring me joy. Ronald, what about for you? Oof. Uh, I think I, I play a lot of video games, so that always makes me feel good. Uh, <laughs> but I go for walks daily. I like doing, like I said, I like doing push-ups. That always, mm -hmm. I don't know why, it just a specific, it's probably because my dad was a drill sergeant. Uh, so he's he's tricked yeah. me into enjoying them. Um, <laughs> yeah. As a man, I could go in a length about why we have psychological attachment to push-ups, but I'll, I'll, I'll stay. <laughs> That's another ones. episode, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's another episode. Uh, but yeah, no, nah, I um, I enjoy hanging out with friends. I enjoy going to the movies, watching television. And, I, you know, just generally, um, I, I like a good event, like, you know, like a storytelling show, uh -huh. a stand-up show, or uh -huh. just something like a friend's uh -huh. party, whatever. Just a gathering is always nice as well. How do you sit with the days when the comedy show and the video games and the walk, it not, it's not, it's still not giving what it was supposed to give. How do you navigate your way through those days? Oh, uh, you know, my sister once told me like, sometimes you can't even take it one day at a time. You got to take it one moment at a time. Uh, and I feel <laughs> like it's, you know, I've had days where I, I went for the walk. I did the push ups. I saw people and I still don't feel so good uh, about myself or the people around me, you know, uh, I like to schedule therapy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like you know what? I'll, mm -hmm, I got therapy mm -hmm. coming up next week. I, I can look forward to that. But also, I think sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, in those moments, what I what I find is that I'm mostly just overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by everything that's going on around me, by life stresses and all of that. And I, I, I it's funny. I, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but Brene Brown said this one time: uh, the opposite of of uh, being overwhelmed is nothingness. And sometimes that just means you just got to sit and stare at a wall for a while. You just got to sit down and just do nothing for a minute, like not occupy your brain. Just kind of like, 
you know, maybe even turn on some music and just, you know, dive into the lyrics. Sometimes you got to get that good cry out. You know what I mean? Like it just like mm. sitting in the moment and just letting it overwhelm you for a minute. My kids have a book called Grumpy Monkey and <laughs> he goes through this whole thing where his friend's like, well, why do you feel grumpy? And he's like, I don't know. And at the end, he's like, I just need to be grumpy. I just need to sit here. I might feel better in a few days. I might feel better in an hour, but I just need to be grumpy right now. And that is so true to what Ronald was just saying, like just being with that, doing nothing. Sometimes that's just what we have to do, I feel. Yeah, well, that you know, that does remind me, I know that, that Ronald talked a, a little bit about relationships, like friendship relationships too, uh, and, and people that we get to be close to that help us. And I'm wondering, Rebecca, do you have people that you get to talk to about these issues or do you feel that you have to kind of navigate them all on your own, at least in the way your life is structured? Yeah, I think my, I mean, definitely I speak with my partner. He is so supportive, um, but he can, it's, it's from a different perspective in that he, he's in the military and he yeah. sees it in a very different way. Um, yeah. And he's also a nurse, so he sees the medical community in that need to, um, what's the word he's, uh, advise, I guess, um, educate the, the, the patient on things. So, you know, I'll come home and complain about the doctor appointment. And he's like, well, the doctor kind of has to. Um, so mm. sometimes he doesn't quite get it from the same perspective. And it's funny, like with my friends, so many times it circles back around to, well, like, well, I'm doing this diet. You want to do that with me? Or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. I don't, that's mm -hmm. not the point I was getting to, guys. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I don't really have anywhere else, no uh, no other outlet to have this conversation, or at least I haven't found it yet. I, 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 this is a tough question, but you could say, why is it important for y'all? Yeah. <laughs> why is it important for y'all what my body is? Like, why is that important to you? And likely they're going to answer and say they're concerned about your health. And if you could respond to that and say, if I could prove to you that I was 100% healthy and still fat, would you still be concerned about my health? And likely at that point, they will pause <laughs> because most people, if they tell the truth, it turns out. And actually, we talked about this in episode four of Wait For It, where we kind of talk about some people who went through bariatric surgery. And all of them, uh -huh. they said, I said, if you could remain the same weight with no health implications, would you still get surgery? And they all said yes, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> like at the end of the day, we realize that it's really mm -hmm. about the stigma. So if you could find a way to, to have them confront the stigma of weight and just say like, hey, I'm doing the best I can. I'm raising four kids. I have a job like I'm I'm getting up every morning. Like the last thing I need to be concerned about is whether or not, you know, my body is in a, is in an acceptable place for you. I'm just try I'm trying to accept it myself. And I think like it's probably tough for people to hear that. Uh, but it's I, I mean, I have the advantage of having a podcast, so I haven't had to have a lot of those conversations. So it's just like, <laughs> hey, have you listened to my podcast? And then after that, I find that people are like, oh, I didn't know you were thinking <laughs> all that. But like for you, it's probably a little trickier because you have to confront it directly and, and talk about stigmatization. One of the answers that occurs to me to your question, Rebecca, is that, boy, family is tough because they're going to be how they're going to be. And and they're more to the point they're going to relate to us how they're going to relate to us because they've been relating us to us that way for however many decades and uh i often find a lot of help through uh finding chosen family other people who are experiencing similar things and we can talk about that sometimes that's in real life you meet someone and it's like you click and you realize oh we have we sort of have this in common but sometimes that's online you know that's finding places online where those people are having these conversations and you sort of get to meet people that way. Yeah. That's a good question though. And that's one that I, I'd love to hear from our listeners too about that. If you listen to this episode and you have some thoughts about how we find community that is trying to change the way we think about these systemic things and how do we bond with other people, feel free to write into the show and talk about that. And Ronald, do you have final words of advice for the people listening who are like, I'm struggling with this and I'm struggling to accept my body and everyone's telling me that it's wrong. And I know that I shouldn't listen to that, but I don't know what to do. What are your, some of your final thoughts? I think you just have to kind of look in the mirror and, and look yourself in the eye and just start talking to yourself. And 
for me, that's every now and then I, I, when I do that, I'm, I get so disconnected from myself, like, especially since the pandemic Mm. and all that, like I've, I've gone through so many iterations of who I am and who I think I am and who I want to be. And sometimes I just have to look myself straight in the eye in the mirror and say like, you know what? You're fine. Like you're good. You're alive. You're doing this. Mm. You're, you're, you're working hard. You're, you have a ambition. You're reaching for the future. You are doing the best that you can. You make mistakes and you deal with the consequences of those mistakes, but you're still doing the best you can. You're not the result of all of your mistakes. So I think you really just have to kind of like encourage yourself. I don't know how people feel about affirmations, but like find an affirmation that works for you. And one that always works for me is I have everything that I need. Uh, and sometimes, mm. sometimes I don't know if that's true, but I say it anyway, and it makes me feel better, <laughs> you know? So find something yeah. that like works yeah. for you, whether it be an affirmation, whether it just be encouraging yourself, um, find something that's going to make you be more present, feel yourself in that moment, not shy away from like, you know, the difficult nature of the world and the conversations we need to have. And just, I don't know, just f- focus on yourself. I think if you could focus on you. And you can be kind to yourself. I think you'll find that a little bit every day you'll feel okay. That's beautiful. Thank you, Ron. Okay, so I do realize that (laughs) the whole premise of this show is we tell you how to do certain things. But maybe there are some things that, I don't know, just don't have a how-to. And maybe this is one of them. Like, it could be that there is no set of steps that you can take to suddenly be free of the deeply internalized obsession with how our bodies are supposed to look. As Ronald pointed out, what works one day may not work the next. So in that sense, it's a daily practice, not a challenge that you overcome as much as something you just, I don't know, experience with honesty and humility. So maybe instead of a list of insights, I'm going to just share with you something that a religious friend once told me. The way his church defines sin, he said, is as a failure to recognize the beauty of what has been created. And I think about this often. To me, this makes all of the work of being a human less about morality and more about love right? Like about appreciation. Like you may not be able to love your body in this superficial sense, but maybe, just maybe, you can come to recognize and appreciate the beauty of its creation. I want to extend a huge thanks to Rebecca and to Ronald for being part of this conversation. Go check out Ronald's beautifully nuanced podcast, Wait For It. And if you have any thoughts about today's show or advice of your own, send us a note at howtoitslate.com or leave us a voicemail at 646-495-4001. That's also where you can send any questions too. And if you like what you heard today, please give us a rating and a review and tell a friend. That helps us help more people. How To's executive producer is Derek John. Joel Meyer is our senior editor. The show is produced by Rosemary Belson and Kevin Bendis. Merritt Jacob is senior technical director. Charles Duhigg created the show. Courtney Martin is my co-host. And I'm Carmel Wallace. Thanks for listening.